Consider the lobster. The lobster is a modest shellfish, but it's garnered a reputation for being fancy in part because of how expensive it is pound for pound. Lobster is the kind of thing that your parents taught you never to order at a restaurant when someone else is footing the bill because it would make you look like a selfish jerk. But lobster wasn't always this fancy wealthy people food that we know it as today. In fact, in the 18th and 19th centuries, lobster was a trash food. There was an abundance of lobster in the coastal cities of the US. There was more lobster than they knew what to do with. They had to get rid of it, but no one wanted to eat it. So they fed it to prisoners and indentured servants and slaves. So what changed? How did the humble lobster climb the social ladder and go from being cheap and disregarded to being one of the most decadent dishes on restaurant menus? Well, summer vacation. Seasonal tourists, mostly wealthy, came to Boston, which had a booming lobster industry, to vacation. And like any good tourists, they wanted an authentic taste of the city. So they ate lobster. Lots of lobster. <laughs> and they didn't hate it. When they went back home to Washington or New York or wherever, they still craved lobster though. But they couldn't get that good Boston lobster anymore, so they sent away for it. Mail ordered lobster straight from the source. And they were willing to pay quite the premium for it. So obviously the Bostonians obliged. I mean, they really wanted to get rid of all of this lobster. They shipped out the lobster at exorbitant prices, which then made lobster expensive, which then gave the impression that it was fancy, which meant more wealthy people wanted to eat it, which continued this feedback loop until lobster became what it is today, expensive. <laughs> Somehow, a food once eaten only by poor and marginalized people became a food for the elite. The wealthy's desire for that authentic experience made it so that authentic food made its way up the social ladder. But the people never did. As the lobster became more and more associated with the wealthy, the poor who had once eaten it stayed poor. I want you to think of the trashiest food you can imagine. It can be something prepackaged or something you prepare, but either way, it needs to be trashy. In fact, put it in the comments because I really want to see your opinions on trash foods. Got it? Good. Now, would you eat it? If you answered no, why not? What is it about that food that is so appalling to you? Now I want you to imagine the person who you think would eat that food. What is that person like? What kinds of clothes are they wearing? What does their body look like? What color is their skin? Why do you think that they're eating that food? What makes that food palatable to them when it isn't palatable to you? Now put a pin in that and keep it in the back of your mind as we go. So trashy means different things to different people. For some, it's the same thing as tacky, where it describes something with the veneer of quality or elegance, but which is actually just a cheap knockoff. For others, though, trashy elicits the idea of white trash, which is the specific brand of trashiness that I will be focusing on in this video. White trash is similar to tackiness, except that when a person is tacky, they're trying to hide the lack of value of what they're wearing or doing. But a person who is white trash almost takes pride in it. White trash people are people who know that their clothes, food, appearance, and actions are outside the norm, but who don't care to actually try to get back into the norm. So what is white trash food? 
well, food that white trash people eat, obviously, but what does that actually look like? To answer this, I want to turn to the article that actually inspired this episode, Trash Food by Chris Offit. In this article, Offit talks about how he, a man who grew up poor in Kentucky, had to fight his whole life to not be seen as white trash. And one of the things that labeled him that way was the food he ate. In the article, he lists a few white trash foods. Within certain communities, it's become popular to host white trash parties where people are urged to bring Cheetos, pork rinds, Vienna sausages, jello with marshmallows, fried bologna, corn dogs, RC cola, Slim Jims, Fritos, Twinkies, and cottage cheese with jelly. In short, the food I ate as a kid in the hills. If you do a quick Google search of trashy foods, you find articles and listicles and Reddit posts listing things like tuna casserole, Velveeta queso, seven layer dip, sloppy joes, American cheese, and pigs in a blanket. So what makes these foods white trash? Well, I have come up with a few general characteristics that they all have in common. White trash food is cheap. It has inexpensive ingredients or it's available in bulk. White trash food has a long shelf life. It's not fresh, usually not organic. Think canned or frozen foods. White trash food is simple. It's very easy to eat or to prepare. And it's made of versatile parts. Its ingredients can be used in a variety of dishes. So now the question is, what makes these elements trashy? Well, to answer that, we need to realize that food isn't a neutral thing. It's tied to culture and ethnicity and availability and seasonality and class. See, white trash food isn't inherently bad. It's only bad because of what it implies about the people who eat it. To explore this concept a little more, let's return to Chris Offit's trash food. He ties food to class this way. The term white trash is an epithet of bigotry that equates human worth with garbage. It implies a dismissal of the group as stupid, violent, lazy, and untrustworthy. The term white trash food is not about food. It's coded language for social class. It's about poor people and what they can afford to eat. The term white trash is class disparagement due to economics. The thing about all of the foods that we listed earlier and the characteristics that define them and tie them together is that they're all poor people foods. White trash food is just another term for poor people food. But why is it poor people food? Well. Cheap is obvious. You want food that you can get in bulk for cheaper because it's cheaper. Even for things like animal meat, like deer or squirrel or even farm-raised cattle, pound for pound, it is way cheaper to hunt it or raise it yourself than it is to buy it. Foods having a long shelf life is also good. It means that you can buy a bunch of foods right after you get your paycheck and then that food will last you until you get your next paycheck. It means that you can stock up, which is especially useful if you do seasonal work, like agriculture. Foods being simple and being made of versatile parts means that they're easy to prepare, and part of that ease comes from being able to just throw a bunch of shit together and know that it will taste good. I mean, try this. Take a box of pasta or any starch, you can use rice or potatoes if you want, plus two cans of any kind of vegetable, throw in some cheese and maybe some meat, and then throw that in the oven for 30 minutes at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, and chances are it will probably be pretty good. Now this is something that I actually do a lot. I make these starch plus vegetables plus cheese plus meat casseroles a ton. I do rotini or farfalle, which I just call bow ties, plus a can of tomatoes and a can of spinach, plus either mozzarella or parmesan cheese, 
and then throw it in the oven and it's really good. Something else I do that I just had for dinner last week is rice, can of tomatoes, can of corn, can of black beans, plus some shredded cheddar and maybe ground beef. And it's also really, really good. Casseroles are cheap and easy and they taste good. Foods that are inexpensive, last a long time, are really easy to prepare a lot of different dishes from, and that taste good, are really valuable, especially to working class families. But now, because of poor working class and other marginalized people's history of making and eating these kinds of foods, our culture associates cheap foods with poor people. And if there's one constant in American culture, it's that we kind of hate poor people. Now, I'm sure that there are people in the comments telling me, how dare you? How dare you talk about white trash people like this? I mean, look at you, you're all dressed up drinking wine. This is cranberry juice, actually, by the way. You don't know the first thing about how these people live. Well, I'm from Appalachia. I'm from a small town, and my family actually lived outside of town. We lived on a ridge far enough out that we didn't have cable TV, we only had dial-up internet, and we really only had cell phone service on a good day. We had a garden and a barn, and I played in the woods and never wore shoes. We were also pretty poor, like everyone in our town was. We were too far north to be real coal country, and too far south and too far east to be in the Rust Belt. Our town was an oil and gas town. We had pipeliners come through, raise our housing costs, ruin our land, and then leave. And with industry dying, poverty and drug abuse seeped in even worse than before. The default setting of our town was white trash. I grew up being West Virginia garbage. And we ate garbage, <laughs> at least by the standards of outsiders. We ate casseroles and bologna sandwiches and pepperoni rolls and grits and deer and squirrel. We had a dessert called potato candy that was literally just a tablespoon of boiled mashed potato mixed with three or four cups of powdered sugar, rolled out, covered in peanut butter, rolled back up, and then cut into bite-sized pieces. It has a similar taste and texture to cowtails, which I think are also a white trash candy, so I don't know if there's actually a classy analog to potato candy. We also literally had a dish in my family unironically called, and I'm not making this up, white trash casserole. We ate trash. We ate good food, too. Uh, homemade ethnic foods, baking from scratch, good and good for you foods made from what we picked from our garden. But when I was growing up, I didn't really see the distinction between good food and trash food. It was all just food. And it all tasted good. It was relatively easy to make, it was mostly inexpensive, just like Chris Offit, I didn't realize that I ate trash until I left my hometown to go out into the world and be an adult or whatever. It wasn't until I left my family's little holler in the hills 
that I realized just how trashy I really was. I do really unironically love Slim Jims. I definitely felt a little embarrassed. When I realized that casseroles are apparently a white trash thing, I was surprised? Like, why? Do you not realize just how cheap and easy casseroles are to make? And they taste really good? Why would you not want to eat casseroles? Around the time that I started to accept my upbringing instead of fighting it, a weird thing started to happen. Life is all there, older than the trees, younger than the mountains, blowing like the breeze, country roads. West Virginia and Appalachian culture in general became mainstream. Things like Fallout 76, for better or worse, and Hillbilly Elegy, for better or worse, started to make their way into the public consciousness. Suddenly, people knew West Virginia was a state. They knew all the words to country roads, they knew what pepperoni rolls were, and they loved it. Just like Chris Offit's experience with white trash parties, I was starting to see people who did the same thing with my backwards, trashy Appalachian foods. They were being celebrated. Now, you'd think that this would be a good thing, right? And yeah, to some extent it was. I don't have to constantly explain that no, I'm not from Western Virginia, and yes, West Virginia is actually a state. But it was also just weird. It was weird to see things I'd been made fun of for most of my adult life suddenly celebrated and literally devoured by the upper echelons of society. Suddenly, what I ate wasn't weird anymore. Well, it wasn't bad weird, it was more weird in a cool novelty kind of way. But is that a good thing? I mean, what is it that has so suddenly turned the tables and made my Appalachian trash foods acceptable? Well, nothing good. So what's the actual problem with trash food? It's the term used for the food poor people eat, but now that white trash potlucks are getting popular, isn't that a good thing? I mean, doesn't that mean that now the stigma will be gone and poor white trash folks can eat whatever they want without judgment? Well, not quite. Implicit in the menu of white trash parties is a vicious ridicule of the people who eat such foods on a regular basis. People who attend these parties are cuisinally slumming temporarily visiting a place they never want to live. They are the worst sort of tourists. They want to see the Mississippi Delta and the hills of Appalachia, but are afraid to get off the bus. See, when people celebrate these foods, they aren't actually celebrating the people who actually eat these foods. They're putting on the costume of poor white trash person and wearing it around for fun. Because it tastes good. Because it's fun to pretend to be something you're not. I mean, imagine being so poor that you eat garbage like Fritos or bologna. Ugh, gross. But the thing is, when someone wears the costume of poor person, they aren't breaking boundaries or ending stigma. They're just perpetuating classism. The entire concept of trash foods is classes. Because it's not just about the food. It's never been about the food. It's about the people and seeing them as less than people. Seeing them as trash. Economic status dictates class and diet. We arrange food in a hierarchy based on who originally ate it until we reach mullet, gar, possum and squirrel, the diet of the poor. The food is called trash, and then the people are. 
When the white elite take an interest in the food poor people eat, the price goes up. The result is a cost that prohibits poor families from eating the very food that they've been condemned for eating. The status of the food rose, but not the people. They just had less to eat. See, food can become a means of perpetuating prejudice. When foods rise up that social ladder, even if only for a night when they find themselves on the dining room table of a wealthy suburbanite throwing a white trash party, but the people stay down, you begin to see a whole group of people, a group of people who are already struggling as lesser, as embarrassing and gross and weird and as trash. Polite society regards me as stupid, lazy, ignorant, violent, and untrustworthy. I am trash because of where I'm from. I am trash because of where I shop. I am trash because of what I eat. But human beings are not trash. When we think of trash food, we think of food that's really unhealthy. I mean, part of what makes these foods so cheap is because of how processed they are. But what actually shapes our idea of what healthy means? Where do we get our concepts of calories and how much fat and sodium we're supposed to have in a day? I mean, we might have some idea, you know, scientists and nutritionists and teachers and federal guidelines and whatever. But, what if I told you that all of that is based on lies force-fed to us by food companies who pay the government to say that their foods are healthy? Stick around for the next episode where we will look into the actual, real conspiracy behind the foods we eat. Bye, folks. I take back what's been stolen from me Little by little, piece by piece Until I'm complete Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. This one I know is a little different from my Lovecraft series, but I'm trying something new, uh, so hopefully you like it. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, feel free to follow me on Twitter, at Zoe underscore the B, uh, where I do just a lot of angry tweeting, especially about education and stuff. And if you want to support me so I can keep making these videos on my adjunct salary, check out my Patreon linked in the description below. I do also just want to give a huge thank you to everyone who has liked and commented and subscribed the feedback has been really overwhelmingly positive, and it really does mean a lot. Uh, it means more than I can put into words, and I'm an English teacher, so that is quite the feat. Uh, but seriously, guys, thank you all so much for the kind words of support. You are all absolutely amazing, and I'm excited to keep doing what I'm doing and making stuff that you all like. So thanks guys, and I will see you in the next one. I actually really do love Slim Jims, by the way. This was like the most exciting part of making this was that I get to eat Slim Jims. It's great. <laughs>